If you have ever observed the behavioural patterns of skateboarders, you have more than likely witnessed them skateboarding where they shouldn't. Although this tendency is not observed in every skater, over the years researchers have noticed a correlation between the act of riding a skateboard and electing to skate where it is not allowed. This practice has not come without resistance. Property owners, security guards and municipal law enforcement have notoriously been the largest opposition due to the high audible volume, potential for property damage and liability concerns of this dangerous activity. With some regularity, this act of skateboarding on private property results in the skateboarder's removal from the premises. There is very often a brief, ritualistic confrontation that follows. During these seemingly scripted exchanges, there is one prevailing question skateboarders are faced with. A question so obvious and simple, but historically difficult to answer to the satisfaction of the disgruntled property owner. The question, why can't you go skate at the skate park instead? This is a valid question. Why does the skateboarder opt to skate in an area that is not designated for their recreation? For many years, it confounded biologists and anthropologists alike. However, we have found some surprising implications in the pursuit of an answer to this question. Join us as we attempt to demystify this confounding phenomenon. This is what we will be exploring today, the world of spots, skate spots. A spot is an area of land that contains one or more obstacles, of which have the potential to be skated on, over or around. Spots can be broken into two distinct categories, domesticated spots and naturally occurring spots. Structures and facilities built for the sole purpose of skateboarding, like skate parks, are domesticated spots, while any structures that are not built with the intention of skateboarding are considered naturally occurring spots or wild spots. For the uninitiated, let's go over a couple rudimentary types of obstacles a skateboarder might encounter at a spot. Rail. They come in many different varieties. For example, you have flat bars, handrails, kinked rails and curved rails. A kink refers to a sharp change in the slope of a rail along the y-axis. A curve refers to horizontal shifts and bends on the z-axis. Rails can be round, square and sometimes more abstract shapes. Stairs demarcated by how many steps they possess. This is an eight stair. Rails and stairs have a symbiotic relationship and can be commonly found together for obvious reasons. Manual pad, aptly named after the trick commonly performed on them, a manual. Gap, identified by their lack of materiality. A gap is a void, a transitional space between the skateboarder's launching and landing points. Bank, also referred to as a bump. A good building block of many spots. A bank is a general term for any canted surface where the ground takes a slanting position. Two banks connected perpendicularly is known as a hip. Ledge, a prolific obstacle with varying shapes, sizes and building materials. Often intended to be sat on, these obstacles serve a different utility for the skateboarder. Ledges, like rails, are a common place for grinds and slides. If a ledge follows a downward incline, it is known as a hubber. Curb, distinguished by its stubby and dwarfish presence. Curbs present a unique opportunity for the skateboarder to partake in a grind or slide, but without the need to jump in the air. They are a beloved object to skateboarders over the age of 30 for this reason. These are the fundamentals of many spots, but it is important to note that we are merely scratching the surface here. It is easiest to identify most of these obstacles in a domestic setting of a skate park. Here at a skate park, obstacles are clearly defined, often separate. This is not as true of naturally occurring spots. The reason obstacles are easy to label, categorise and define in this domestic setting is the same reason the skateboarder might be compelled to wander from their home in search of spots out in the wild. 
In the wild, spots are less cut and dry. The line between what separates the different types of obstacles is blurred. The world of naturally occurring spots is so vast and complex that it is virtually impossible to catalogue and define in its entirety, despite the efforts of many. This is partially what makes naturally occurring spots so interesting. The lack of defined obstacles forces the skater to use the spot in a more unique way and to find its meaning on their own. This spot is technically a small set of stairs, but it is more frequently skated as a ledge. Or perhaps a manual pad. Or both. The weirder the spot, the more the skater is encouraged to think of imaginative ways to skate it. And how a skateboarder chooses to collaborate with a spot is a form of self-expression. In contrast, take a look at this skate park. Notice how the ramps are placed. The obstacles are all oriented in a way that promotes skateboarding in a single straight line. Back and forth, back and forth. This park is very clearly communicating how it wants to be skated and makes it difficult for the skateboarder to travel in any other direction than is intended. This can result in feelings of monotony and seems to discourage creativity. This experience can be compared to eating the same exact meal every day. Eventually, we all want to try something new. Street skating feels more enticing. It offers a personal challenge and is founded in the spirit of exploration. It provides the opportunity to discover obstacles and test one's ability on the unknown. If a playground is a place of limitless possibilities for a child's imagination to run free, a skate park is not akin to a playground at all, but instead, the classroom. As a brief exercise, we will put ourselves in the shoes of a skateboarder. There are many things to consider when searching for a spot. Ground condition. Be aware of cracks, pebbles and various detritus. Understand the relationship polyurethane has with various materials. What will slide? What will stick? Run up. This is how much space is allotted to initiate a trick. Hazards. This could be anything in proximity to the obstacle that might affect how it is skated or pose certain challenges. Traffic. Although dense urban areas can be an oasis for spots, vehicle and pedestrian traffic flourishes in these areas as well. If a spot contains an abundance of hazards or is in poor condition, sometimes the skateboarder will tamper with it in order to make the area more skatable. This opens up an ethical can of worms, as well as an ideological one. The line between fixing a spot and creating a spot is a very blurry one. This practice calls into question what truly makes a spot naturally occurring. Our research has identified a shift that occurs in an individual's perspective when waking up to the world of spots. Once you begin to understand the true potential of the concrete beneath your feet, the possibilities can no longer be overlooked, as they are by so many. These everyday objects present new meaning. What was originally created to help guide someone down the stairs is now the means for a truly epic grind. Let's take a look at a more niche obstacle, the pole jam. The pole jam can be seen as a case study that embodies an expanded perspective an individual can gain by seeing and understanding the world of spots. Often a spot is created from the triumphs of architecture and urban planning. A pole jam, however, is created through failure, on accident. Flaws and imperfections can easily be seen as something that detracts from the value of an object. In the world of spots, these mistakes offer an opportunity. This bent pole is not just a defective barrier, but an honourable obstacle. While this process may appear on its exterior as a mindless act of damaging property, it is a highly thoughtful and inventive way of moving through the world.
It is no surprise that landholders take pains to prevent such an activity. Still, the hindrances do not achieve their intended result. They only serve as a bonding agent for these participants. All skateboarders share this common experience, and the group is strengthened through solidarity with one another. Our attempt to rationalise street skating has helped us better understand the skateboarder, but it does not justify the endeavour. In truth, it is a rather irrational practice. Like the compulsion to make art, the force behind it does not come from a place of logic. It is only felt, and also like art, skateboarding is a result of radical self-expression. This is why no matter how many skate parks are built, the fundamental need for creative exploration will not be quenched. It is this impulse that defines the human spirit. Thank you.